Thanks very much for uh, attending. Uh, we have probably about 80 people will be attending the whole workshop, and then an extra 20 or so that'll be at the lunch keynote. We'll announce some logistical things throughout the day, and I'll cover a few this morning, just as general housekeeping. But first, I'm Dan Cicliano. I'm a professor here at the law school. I'm the faculty director of the Rock Center for Corporate Governance, which is a joint center that was endowed by Arthur Rock and Tony Remby about six years ago uh, with the interest of generating more cohesive analysis in areas of corporate governance. And corporate governance as an academic area is what we like to refer to as highly imperial, which is just a kind of a nicer way of saying we go around looking at topics we like and we say, that's corporate governance. Oh, look, that's corporate governance too. And so we just kind of gather up all sorts of interesting topics. One of them is obviously immigration workplace compliance. So anything that might show up in a shareholder lawsuit, in an SEC commentary, an SEC filing, or otherwise impact kind of shareholders on a day-to-day -day basis, we say is fair game. So that's why, if you're curious, the Rock Center for Corporate Governance is sponsoring this particular program. So uh, thanks for coming. And uh, let me just very quickly acknowledge a handful of folks. Uh, we have Chuck Miller floating here. He's one of the co-directors of the program. And Marcine Seed, who is here momentarily. Marcine's over here. And we have a lineup of spectacular speakers who we will introduce as we go along. We're very, very lucky in that people seem to want to come experience some of the weather. Uh, and they've, they've all come to help us today. So um, and again, as a kind of a backdrop to all this, I will acknowledge them later in the day. But the program group, if anything goes well, or the food tastes good, or the signage was well done, that's the, due to the hard work of the program group. If things are confusing or otherwise mistaken, it's probably my fault, actually. So um, thanks uh, to the program group and to everyone who's helping us kind of run the show. So, so with that, why don't I jump into what we're going to call kind of the, the teaser of the opening. So uh, we started announcing the program. This is the second annual program we did in June of last year. And our goal was to roughly double the attendance this year, which we've done. So we're happy about that. Um, and also to bring an even higher caliber uh, of government participation and speakers, uh, which we managed to do as well, which makes us very happy. But um, I purposely put a subtitle into the program itself, which was something like, could there be $104 billion of unrecognized I-9 compliance liability on US corporate balance sheets? So I know how general counsels and CFOs think. And I also know how the corporate environment is in terms of like letting you spend even $149 to go get seven CLEs, including one ethics unit. Um, and so I figured that if you could wave a piece of paper that had a three-figure billion dollar number on it, that might help you. And so um, it worked pretty well. We saw a sudden surge. Like the next day when we added this up to about 12 people registered, and they had titles like comptroller, CFO, <laughs> compliance manager. I loved it. So let me go through and say why uh, that number is plausible. By the end of this, you'll either say, well, I guess it wasn't a made-up number, but you'll have doubts as to whether or not it'll ever manifest. Or I might convince you that in the very long run, it's a little bit low. So let me just go through the mechanics. I'm the guy who's going to tie this to the world of corporate governance and securities. Throughout the day, the harder work of actually understanding and explaining the law will fall to the panels. But I get to do kind of the fun big picture stuff. So first, US population, much harder to pin down exactly than you would expect. So we pick a compromise number of 310 million. The population as a whole has an assessment as to how many people are participating in the workforce at any given time. At the moment, we're actually running at an all-time low, um, but taking a five-year average, you end up with just under two-thirds. Um, we are a productive lot. So the average number of employers for each employee is 1.12, give or take. That fluctuates as well. What does that mean? That means that I have a full-time job, and then I also have a little part-time job on weekends. Or I might have two part-time jobs. Or I might have three part-time jobs, and my spouse doesn't have any jobs. So on average, that's 1.5 between the two of us. So it's interesting. We, on average, have more than an employer. For those of you who do I-9s, you realize why this is relevant. Um, then estimated annual workforce turnover. This is a number that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, if you want to go down a rabbit hole and waste a few days, go online and start calling people from the Bureau of Labor Statistics about their census methodology. And they are so excited to talk to you. I think because no one ever calls them, uh, you can spend days trying to sort out this one thing, which is, so how many people actually change jobs every year? And as soon as I asked that, I realized it's a hard thing. It's not just who changes job, who enters the workforce. Do you count interns? Do you count interns that convert to actual full-time employees? Do you count it if they worked for five days and then came back four weeks later and were rehired? Is that a turnover? Ugh. So we have a range. So 
11.8 to 26.4%. Uh, the technical term statistically for that is uselessly wide. Um, and so we picked a number, 13.4%, trying to be conservative. So here are the tabulations once you have these foundational numbers. Annual I-9 creation demand, it's a function of how many people start jobs with new employers in any given year times the number of people who are doing that times the turnover. Annual I-9 creation demand, and this we think is actually a low number, is around 30 million based on this. Again, because even if you go and you work for four hours a week for only six weeks, for that employer and that seasonal, you are supposed to fill out an I-9. So we're tracking this perfect creation of I-9 demand. The 10-year no purge accumulation. The one free lunch in I-9 world, probably, is that under certain rules, you can get rid of old I-9s. Now, it's very specific, and we'll talk about it later, but most people don't. Most big companies don't. It's interesting. So we make this one assumption. We can't go back too far because we can't really estimate you know, more than 10 years back in terms of the analysis we gave you. But we give up all of those numbers, which we think number in the tens of millions of I-9s lurking out there. But then we assume that, by and large, people don't purge because they don't, weirdly. Uh, then we give a very nice gift to this analysis, which is we don't use the statistically valid and observed substantive error rate of almost 50%. We use a much lower rate, which excludes the error of not actually completing the I-9, which is not necessarily accurate, but it seems so unbelievable if I put $300 billion of liability. So we actually used a much lower number. We ignore every other error, which, of course, probably isn't how it would play out. We create an average estimated violation cost. This is the number that could be really, really low or really, really high. We have a violation fine built in. We assume there's a certain amount of cost of managing that. So we just picked a number that was easy to do math-wise. Um, we'll make this spreadsheet available online if you want to play with it for your own purposes. But you, know, you can fill in almost any number there and really change the number. So if this were a Visa commercial, it would say, and the undiscovered liability is priceless. But it's not. It's $103 billion, uh, almost $104 billion. This is a big number. And you say to yourself, yeah, but no one seems to care. No one shows up. I haven't seen a fine of much over a million dollars ever. So why would it matter? It's a legitimate critique, but I think there might be some things are, that are happening. So first, why does I-9 compliance have anything to do with securities compliance and litigation? Well, in Sarbanes-Oxley, we no longer call it Sarbanes-Oxley because it's been long enough that it's simply part of the securities laws, right? So we just got to get over it and say, you know, it was Sarbanes-Oxley, but now it is the law. So under Sarbanes-Oxley, we have something called Section 404, which is essentially a requirement that anything that could impact the company and has a you know, indirect or direct financial impact needs to be evaluated for process. So evaluating your accounts receivable, validating your cash balances. These are all very obvious things that you have to actually have your auditor go through and say, yeah, look at that. You have security systems in place. You double check yourself. You have a process and a method for making, every, making sure everything is right. I-9s when you remove the word immigration in I-9 and you describe what an I-9 is without naming it to an auditor, they say, wow, that's definitely a top five process evaluation. It's funny, auditors are kind of just getting into this, but section 404 arguably applies to your I-9 compliance regime because it is material, impactful in its omission, and can substantially move the value of the company if you end up in headlines or have a big enough headline fine. So it, just like wage and hour, cash balance management, foreign exchange management, you know, everything else. It's, it's in a long list of things. Whistleblower under Dodd-Frank makes a big change to the world of how is it that anybody learns about or cares about an I-9 compliance violation. We'll come back to whistleblowers, but the whistleblower makes a big difference. The plaintiff's bar is relentlessly creative. Plaintiff's bar does not understand I-9s by and large. They understand it a lot better than they did, say, five years ago, but they have a long ways to go. I do not think you should underestimate the plaintiff's bar ability to think about how a company's failure to manage its I-9 program might have inadvertently destroyed value for the plaintiff's bar clients, shareholders or otherwise. And eventually, it'll come home to roost. The markets also um, have kind of thin trading, so the markets have become strange. And I teach finance at the law school, and I start out the class by saying, we actually now know nothing about finance, but they haven't updated the textbook, so I'll teach it the same way as before. No, I don't really say that, but something, you know, we don't quite understand what's happening in the public marketplace, but we know that trading is thinner, the markets are more responsive, they're looking for any reason to do things, and so news like I-9 failures now might matter more than it did in the past. And then finally, there are reasonable parallels in other areas of compliance. There's this thing called a Wells Notice that the SEC sends to both individuals and companies, and it's kind of like a, hey, heads up, we actually think you have an issue. We're investigating it now. And there's a big debate about whether or not you have to disclose 
this Wells notice? Because it might come to nothing, right? But it might come to something. So there's a robust debate. There's some best practices around. You have to tell the world when you have a Wells notice if, and other times you don't have to. We don't even talk like that about I-9s. And yet, it's strange because the average Wells notice is a lot less important than the average NOI, by the way, in terms of like likely outcome. And then finally, there's been an uptick in actual securities class actions filings related to, though typically not about I-9s. It is now part of the kitchen sink that gets thrown in. So at least it's being included in the roster of things to think about and kind of keep a plaintiff's uh, bar to option open. So here's the question about whether or not you think this will ever manifest or happen. At a policy level, I'm ambiguous. I, uh, ambivalent, rather. I'm probably also ambiguous. But I'm, I'm a little ambivalent about whether or not I want to see this enforcement become consistent and effective. Right? I mean, it's a law. It's on the books. There is some clarity, thanks to some of the people sitting over here. And it'd be nice to have consistency. On the other hand, boy, anything that suddenly sucks you know, $100 billion off of balance sheets kind of scares me. So the question is, will it ever manifest? And here's a little history lesson about some things that we know pretty well. So first, when did it, quote unquote, start that there was compliance legal frameworks and other regulatory actions around issues of employment discrimination? So when did it start, and when did it really start? And by that I mean, when did the laws kind of come into being? When did the regulatory agencies get created? But when did we really have corporates sit up and go, wow, this is actually a really big deal because that one and that one and that one went badly. I got to pay a lot of attention. So um, how many, what, what decade, let's do this by decades. What decade would you say employment-related discrimination issues kind of landed on the books, if not in reality, but on the books, by and large? OK, we've got 80s. I got 60s. Anyone else? 60s. 60s. So the general answer, it's a trick question. There's different parts that happen at different times. ADA is very different from a DEA is very different from you know, Title VII. But let's say that the basic framework was laid down in the 60s. That would be a fair way to describe it. But when did it really get rocking and rolling? When did people suddenly start losing sleep at about employment, discrimination, lawsuits, and the like? Probably in terms of if you had anything that tipped the scale above a million dollars, that was reportable in securities filings, that caused enterprises to fail, meaning they took such a hard hit they actually had to be bought by someone else to continue, really by the 1990s. Now, we understood discrimination in the 70s and the 80s, but really, I mean, massive EEOC class actions, the 90s, right? Um, big settlements on wage and hour in California, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, the 90s and the 2000s. So next one, FCPA. So uh, most people know what the FCPA is now. But when did it first kind of land on the books? Anybody know? What was that? It was the 70s. No one answers that, though. But you just you happen to know. Good for you. So most people would say, oh, the 90s or 2000s. Nah, it came into being in the 70s with a pretty big hurrah about you know, the United States leading an anti global anti-corruption movement to open up free markets to prevent you know, the erosion of trust in the transactions around the world, et cetera, et cetera, to avoid bribing governments. But it's really gotten rock and roll in the 2000s, right? I mean, um, most of the filings have occurred after 2000. The big investigations, the 10 and $100 million costs are really occurring in this last decade. And so my question is, when did I-9 workplace compliance laws, regulations, and frameworks more or less come into being? The decade. Late 80s, with many modifications that mattered in the early 90s. So I was trying to give the benefit of the doubt, but actually, I'm, I'm looking here because like half of the responsibility, in a good way, originates from this side of the room. They'll tell you more about it later. But at, at best, the late 80s, uh, if you blend it, the early 90s, and then stuff really didn't get clear till later. But that's kind of the point. There's an evolution. So when will it matter in a big way? We'd be ahead of schedule relative to large compliance-based you know, legislation and enforcement frameworks if we were already in the midst of the big enforcement. We'd be about a half a decade ahead of schedule. So by the end of this decade, we would be following a timeline that was similar to the EEOC environment, similar to the FCPA environment, and now the I-9. Would it happen that way? I don't know. But if you think about what you'll hear about today, some of the issues have to do with infrastructure, capacity of the government to actually go out and look capacity of the government to analyze and know enough to f give feedback and to assess penalties or give, you know, engage in compromises. So a lot of this capacity, because immigration is a hot button, as we know, is kind of, you know, 
come and gone, but if you look at the trend line, arguably in the last five years, it is a fairly consistent buildup of infrastructure trend line. And then hopefully maybe an understanding of what really is out there uh, in terms of the law and like. So just something to contemplate, a backdrop in terms of why directors and senior executives should care about this stuff and why if you are one of those or if you talk to those folks, you should bring it to their attention. Publicly traded companies and privately held companies get sued all the time, but really it happens in two kind of big buckets from an oversimplified viewpoint. One is, you know, private plaintiffs, right? So shareholders and employees, and these are things you're probably already fairly familiar with. We have federal security suits, we have state law, so most corporate law is state law. There's a lot of federal overlay lately, but it's still at its heart state law. Most of it we think of either as Delaware, New York, sometimes California, but Delaware serves as our center point. So we have all sorts of litigation that arises around the idea that boards and or management should have done better, known better, worked better, and they screwed up and hence they've got some liability. By and large, for members of the boards of directors of these companies, they get kind of a free pass because of something called the business judgment rule. And I'll talk a little bit more about this because there's been a lot of thinking around you know, how far this business judgment rule goes in the context of directors' duties. And so even if you're not a director, I think directors will be appreciative over the next several years to understand better this item of workplace compliance and I-9 programs because like FCPA, if, I, if a week doesn't go by that I don't in, in encounter an independent director of a public trade company who says, well, I wish someone five or six years ago had just explained more to me about this FCPA, well, they don't say FCPA crap, right? Because now we've got this investigation going on. We just cut an $11 million check to our auditors who are running the investigation. And, and it turns out the violation is like an $800 gift to a provincial official in Vietnam. Right? So we're going to spend, you know, when the dust settles, $20 million trying to manage something that was a three-figure gift of flowers to somebody in Vietnam. Right? And, and so they're very frustrated and they, they say, I wish I'd known. We would have set up better systems, et cetera, et cetera. I think the same will eventually be true on the side of I-9 compliance. So um, you have creditor suits, you have employee suits, which you may be familiar with. So on the government side, of course, there's the SEC. So the government can both approach, you know, corporate wrongdoing at a level of civil and criminal. And what's interesting is I-9s have both, as we know. And so you have the Securities and Exchange Commission that is mainly operating at the civil level. The reason we sometimes think criminal is just because they're cooperating with the agencies that can engage in efforts to bring kind of criminal uh, prosecutions to different corporate players. Um, but we have a lot of different entities, including foreign governments, who kind of do that. So the private plaintiffs and then the government constitute kind of the universe of who can show up. Most areas of compliance don't trip over both of these equally. I-9s do. It's interesting, right? We have so far not had a lot on the pl private plaintiff side, but it's going to start happening. And so it's interesting to realize when you make a list of things that corporations can trip over, you know, they tend to be either dominated by the top half or the bottom half, right? So by and large, though the EEOC shows up now and again, um, employee suits and wage and hour stuff, it might be prompted by something at government level, but the big bucks and the big effort and the big time tends to come out of the private side, right? But on the I-9, I think we can debate that the trend is to include both sides, and in the end, the top half might dominate. So as a quick note, why is it that no one ever talks about I-9s? And I have a theory um, in the kind of well-respected, well-operated corporate enterprises, why don't I-9s come up more often? And I'll give you the punchline, I'll give you the analysis. I think the punchline is because we have a huge, what we'll call in the world of social psychology and dynamics, um, complicated distractor, but I think normal people will call it a red herring. And that is undocumented workers. So what happens in a typical corporate environment is someone hears or reads about something in the paper and they say, wow, those guys really blew it, didn't they? And then they'll abstract that entire analysis about an I-9 compliance failure and they'll say, are we employing anyone illegally? And everyone will say, well, we don't think so. Yeah, probably not. I mean, it kind of be hard for us to employ people illegally, frankly. Eh, they don't think about Canadians or people, you know, an OPT violated. They don't realize that we've got, you know, LCA, h one bs I mean, they, they, you, you move all the sophistication aside, and it's probably more or less true, relatively speaking, among a lot of very large corporates that, eh, we're probably not, you know, employing very many people in an undocumented, quote, unquote, illegal fashion. That can be a true statement, and it has not terribly much to do on its face with the practical compliance liability, right? Now, 
uh, the way it plays out, obviously, news coverage is bigger, fines are bigger probably, and the criminal actions issues are relevant if there is egregious employment of unauthorized individuals. Yes, we know that. But the red herring is that no one talks about I-9s if someone says, oh, no, no, we don't have anyone undocumented. So lawyers learn how to spot issues, right? That's what you learn in law school. Um, uh, individuals, actually, so uh, people, I just came back from a few days in Hawaii, and, uh, you know, lifeguards learn how to spot, you know, all sorts of things, including flailing swimmers, but, you know, sharks and so on and so forth, and it's a learned process. You get good at it if you practice. But here's an interesting thing about pilots. Um, why can't novice pilots who, on average, are younger and have much better eyes, and trust me, spotting, I'm a private pilot, spotting, you know, planes is not easy while you're flying, why can't novice pilots do it better? I mean, they have vastly superior kind of, you know, ability to do so, and it's because it's a learned technique, right? So you develop the capacity to do it. So what is a distractor? We have a great guy on campus, and I won't go into the details, so I'll put the links on this stuff so you can, you know, explore to your heart's content. Um, we have a great guy on campus named Cliff Nass. He's fairly famous because he runs one of our research labs that um, studies how people are distracted. Um, the lab includes like a driving simulator. He's a guy who, if you read this about a year or two ago, um, figured out by doing kind of brainwave analysis and simultaneous driving and cell phone analysis that technically, for almost everybody, when you're talking on your cell phone in your car, it's the driving that's the distraction from the phone call, as it turns out, right, from a brain function viewpoint. So he's a kind of a genius at understanding what is it that people do when they're distracted by something or don't pay attention to something. And he's developed this idea of a complex distractor. It's a small part of what he does, but he and I talk about it a lot because one of the questions we have in corporate governance is, for example, how can a board, like Enron's board, which if you ever look at that board, A-list board, Dean of the Business School, was on that board. Fantastic board, all smart. None of them, if you did independent analysis and surveys of their history and their background, would be accused of being lazy or unethical. I mean, this is just a, the independent director of an A-list board, and yet, they didn't fall for a few tricks. They fell for a complete and complex you know, uh, charade that you all look afterwards and you're like, well, how in the world do you not immediately spot that? And on the seventh time you vote to waive the ethical rules so you can do, you know, interested party transactions, doesn't it dawn on you that it's a little weird? We have to keep waiving our ethical rules? So we ask questions about how smart people kind of miss really obvious things. And a satisfactory answer isn't that they're greedy bastards, stupid, or just, you know, you know bad people. It's just probably not true. So one of the things we realize is we have these things called complex distractors where it is the grown-up version of look at the birdie, look at the birdie, and you get your pocket picked, right? So the complex distractor in the world of I-9s is the undocumented uh, workers, where people think, I'm looking for undocumented workers. When I don't find any, or I'm told there aren't any, I, sigh, I breathe a sigh of relief and I move on. But what you've actually missed is the compliance issue. So we have something in piloting where we now know for pilots landing on aircraft carriers, there's this thing called negative target fixation. You actually don't want to keep saying, watch the deck, watch the deck, watch the deck, because you'll smash into the deck, right? You have to do a lot more than that. So negative target fixation makes you miss other subtleties. Same thing with the idea, again, you know, if, if you're landing in an emerging situation on a big open field and there's one barn, you keep saying to yourself, don't hit the barn, don't hit the barn, don't hit the barn, you tend to hit the barn. So, um, and the same thing also with spotting uh, stuff in the ocean. So we now know that people, if a speedboat goes by, Right? and you're looking for things other than the speedboat, unless you're really, really well trained, you'll miss everything else for a couple minutes. It's a, it's a, it's a strange phenomenon, right? So you, your mind, even though the speedboat's gone, will still be thinking about and processing and doing things with the speedboat in its head, and you won't see the other things that are there. So undocumented workers in this world is the distraction from the compliance. Right? The compliance is its own process. It is a compliance function. It, the test isn't, did the compliance work? That's actually one part of evaluating, if you didn't do it well, how badly you get punished. But it isn't actually the objective in and of itself. And so what does a director have to do in this context? So quick one minute version of uh, corporate governance director's duties. There's, uh, there are really two duties. Um, they're very well established. There's the duty of loyalty and the duty of care. As it turns out, in the Delaware Corporation, which almost all publicly US traded corporations are, um, the duty of care has been rendered almost 
irrelevant because a board, a company, can actually amend its charter and its bylaws to allow directors to violate their duty of care but not actually ultimately have to pay out of pocket or be held responsible. Um, it comes from a particular case, whether it's good or bad is a little bit complicated, but um, even in the duty of care, it's not a duty to do the right thing, it's a duty to have tried you know, hard enough to do the right thing and then you're protected by that business judgment rule I made. The last thing we want probably is, you know, judges looking back at business decisions saying, wow, that was a really bad decision, right? Judges aren't in a great position to do that probably. We want people to make mistakes and we want to allow for mistakes. What we want to do is make sure that they didn't violate the idea of engaging enough effort not to make the mistake. But because of this kind of duty of care exculpation that has occurred, um, not engaging in enough effort probably doesn't get you in trouble as a director. But this duty of loyalty issue is something else. So duty of loyalty is by and large the duty not to have conflict. So the way it tends to show up is you can't put your hand in the cookie jar if you're an independent director. right? You need to actually engage in efforts that put the company's interests first. These are all fairly obvious. But one branch of the duty of loyalty that has come out, and it came out because of the OVITs, I remember Disney employed a guy named Ovitz, ended up paying him about $16,000 a minute by the time you added it all up and he got fired after about nine months. And so there was litigation around the fact that there is no way that this employment arrangement didn't somehow violate director's duties. It's so egregiously bad, someone must have done something wrong. Well, in the end, Disney kind of, I wouldn't say got off, but Disney escaped full-blown liability here and directors escaped liability completely, but it was a close call and out of that was born, in part, this idea of good faith. And it didn't come from duty of care, it came from duty of loyalty and it went as follows. A director has a duty to be loyal to the company and place the company's interests first. But part of that is that they need to make some effort to actually do their job. And so if you showed up drunk or took a nap in the middle of the board meeting, it would be such a gross violation of your effort that you would violate your duty of loyalty. It's not duty of care, you're way past the duty of care. It's you're violating this kind of concept of loyalty because you're acting in bad faith. You can't show up and take a nap or show up drunk and expect anyone to believe that you meant to have the best interest of the company at heart. Pretty interesting line of reasoning, it makes sense. But the question is, what does it really mean and that's still being sorted out. But here's one thing it probably means, and we know this from the context of compensation. It probably means that if a director voted on a compensation package for a CEO, and they did not fully understand what that compensation package would cost, meaning they didn't look at it carefully, they didn't add up the numbers, they didn't say, if our stock price doubles, how much will it be? If it falls by half, how much will it be? If we get bought in two years by a big company, how much will it be? If they never asked those questions, that's like putting your head down on the table and closing your eyes and taking a nap. Because they're not that hard to discern. Eh, it takes a few calculations. You might have to hire a consultant, that's fine. But they're not so hard to discern that you can't do it. And then in turn, you, know, you have kind of knowingly and purposefully ignored something that hung out there which was this might be a big price tag and it's a big decision and I should probably pay some attention to it. So this is, there's a few cases percolating their way to the Delaware courts. We'll see where they go but we think this duty uh, loyalty, expansion, and good faith is going to start to get at did the director, it's going to look a little bit like duty of care, but it's different, is going to look a little bit like, hey, could you have known more, better, and made a slightly better decision? So when it comes to I-9 liability, this should be ringing a few modest bells, right? Because we all know that there's I-9 liability sitting on the books because we know that there are I-9s that may or may not be perfect. And so this has something to do with that. Now, does the average director know what an I-9 is? No. Have they ever heard anything about I-9 liability? Probably not. But someday they will ask a question, and the question will be, this I-9 thing, I read about it. We have hundreds of thousands of employees. Do we have any of these problems? And it's at that moment that a company will either make good in providing information, analysis, and data, or it will blow it and set up a chance for bad faith, right? Now what's funny is that director, they're gonna be fine. Because it's not their job to produce the answers, it's their job to actually ask the questions. But lots of interesting ramifications will come of the fact that they did not, in fact, the company did not, in fact, produce sufficient information to make sophisticated decisions. So we haven't reached that point yet, but we're, we're close, I think. Because now auditors are including I-9 issues periodically. In diligence, if you're in the diligence process of acquiring another company, it's now coming up, right? This is now a diligence checkpoint. And so these conversations are happening in the boardroom, and if not enough information comes to bear, then it's, it's kind of like we joke in compliance, don't make a rule. It, you're better off not making the rule that makes you better if you're going to make the rule and not follow it. So if you're going to ask a question and then not answer it thoroughly, 
in a weird way, you kind of set yourself up for bigger problems down the road from a compliance corporate securities viewpoint. So finally, the areas that all have this are options backdating. Options backdating gave some heartache to some companies more than others because it became evident that some questions were asked. And people said, yeah, yeah, very complicated. We'll get back to you, and never did. Right? So that's the difference between you saw lots of option backdating, which kind of seemed to evaporate, and people got off OK. And you wonder. You're like, well, that's strange. And others that went all the way to criminal prosecution. Right? And some of the factual differences had to do with the notion that there was some awareness, but no pursuit of the ultimate information that would have helped make good decisions. So FCPA and noncompliance show the communications now complicate all of this. We saw in 2009, Chipotle's you know, annual report included a disclosure that said, by the way, we have this whole population of people who work for us, and some of them might be undocumented, and that would create all these big problems. Just FYI, shareholders, thanks so much. Right? You know, and we know how that ended. Right? But it, what's interesting, from a securities viewpoint, smart step, by and large. Right? In the end, for corporates, it turns out that performance trumps all. Uh, this is true in almost every area of exposure from a litigation viewpoint in securities law, which is, in the end, if you can perform, 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 you can pay someone a billion extra dollars. But if your company goes to the moon, some people will pick on you, but you're mainly going to get away with it or be forgiven. Same thing, same thing with most of these areas. So Chipotle is a very complicated example. It's almost a counterexample because it turns out that this story seems not to have played out. Right? Stock price doing well, company doing well, no one going to jail. It, it ended OK. Well, that has a lot to do with many factors, but one of the factors is what an amazingly high-performing company. I mean, the company just keeps minting growth and money. And to a certain extent, you know, much will be forgiven, from a shareholder viewpoint, at least, in that environment. So if the same story happened, and it were a different company, like Kentucky Fried Chicken US Bay. So a weird thing about Kentucky Fried Chicken is in Asia, it's experiencing this high brand growth, brand value is going up, it's doing really well. In the United States, KFC has become the you know, punchline in late night television. And so it's kind of suffering a lot of kind of bad performance. If the same thing happened to KFC, the story would not end the same, because everyone would probably pile in from a security viewpoint. Um, so what are the points for the perfect storm? I covered most of this last year. One, we have um, the SEC promoted this idea in Dodd-Frank and promulgated a rule that allows for whistleblowing for uh, undiscovered but knowable liabilities for a company. Uh, I-9 compliance falls right smack dab in the middle of it. We don't see it much because there's a lot of other sexier stuff still out there, and I-9s aren't the low-hanging fruit. The whistleblower gets a bounty of between 10 and 30%, right, if the SEC connects, can, uh, can collect more than a million dollars. Why would the SEC collect the money? Because you're thinking, well, wait, is it ICE that collects the money? Yes, but here's the dotted line that hasn't quite yet been uh, connected, and that is that the SEC is in charge of enforcing books and records rules, right? So each corporate entity has a responsibility to engage in appropriate and reasonable conduct to maintain its books, books and records and to provide information to its shareholders. There's lots of stuff that falls in that, but unlike shareholder litigation, the standards, which without going into too much detail or down the rabbit hole, though I'll post the interesting academic articles that are kind of exploring this. The standard for the SEC to go to a corporate and say, or an issuer, and say, ooh, you violated the books and records regulations here is lower. It's a reasonableness standard, right? And they don't have to show damages, right? So in the shareholder's litigation environment, you have to show that because of what the corporation did or didn't do or did or didn't disclose, that you engaged in a behavior around the shares that caused you to lose money. And you better be in a big group of people, otherwise it's not going to get traction. The SEC, for its books and records violations, needs not to show actual damage to shareholders. Because again, it's a compliance function. The whole point is transparency. So this is a different threshold. We haven't really seen any of these filings come up in the I-9 context, but we see it in lots of other smaller areas. So it's you know, eventually going to happen. So why would the SEC get a million dollar fine? It's because they would show up and say, wow, I-9's part of books and records, and you really suck at this. And this lovely individual has given us all the information in order for us to know that with complete clarity. And we're going to fine you $2 million in books and records violations. And by the way, they get 20% of that. Lucky them. That happens once, and you will start seeing commercials like you do right now for other Dodd-Frank whistleblowing activity that says, are you an aggrieved worker? Are you a compliance official frustrated with your job? Do your senior management not pay attention to the concerns you raise for them? Call me now. I am fill in blank, the plaintiff's lawyer, and I'm here to help you. Not only can you improve your company's performance and help your fellow workers and help your shareholders, but you can make money, as much as $40 million, by reporting the wrongdoing of your company. 
Google online Dodge Frank whistleblower commercials and watch some of these on YouTube. It's terrifying in a weird way. So um, in certain circumstances, compliance and internal audit personnel, as well as public accountants, can become whistleblowers. Isn't that nice? Uh, distinction between securities class action lawsuits and SEC action, that materiality issue that I mentioned. So um, kind of side note about discovery. One of the interesting things, uh, my favorite quote from a former uh, enforcement head for the SEC, Steve Cutler, a very well-known guy, he said, you know, uh, electronic email was the kind of God's gift to modern law enforcement, right? And it's gotten even broader and bigger than that. And so the chatter that your company has internally um, around issues of, gosh, you know, maybe we should tell our lawyers not to answer that auditor letter. Um, that's discoverable, right? I mean, that, that won't go away. No matter what you've done with it, if it's on instant messaging, it's on email, no matter if you delete it, it's there, and it's there to stay. Because otherwise, that's a books and records violation, right? Not having retained the correspondence. And so, you know, all of the communication around issues of I-9s is there. It's discoverable. It hasn't mattered much yet. But um, ask Frank Quattrone whether or not you know, instant messaging matters very much. Right? He's back in vogue and he's doing quite well, but he's the guy who uh, essentially engaged in efforts to kind of cover up some insider trading that happened in 1999 and 2000. And um, you know, it was an innocuous email and one instant message that eventually brought him down. And uh, it had been deleted a long time before, right? And then, of course, they got him on the idea of he sent an email to everyone and said, you know what, so don't do this. Uh, we should all clean up our inboxes. Uh, I know that you guys are using up lots of space, and it's just bad form to keep too much information. You should go through and delete anything that isn't absolutely essential. Oops, he was on notice. That was, that, that's what he really got in trouble for. So, um, so one of the things is using a critical eye, what does the company chatter profile in terms of discussions about I-9 and related compliance? Uh, you know, eventually someone will look really, really bad because it'll look like you're doing the equivalent of shredding documents. You won't mean to do it, but you could. And I want to make a note about something that's come up in the last few days and hadn't given much thought about, and then we'll wrap up and hand over to the next uh, panel. And that is this concept that we call auditor dodging. So um, different pa parties receive correspondence from auditors as a normal course of business when an auditor of a publicly traded company engages in the appropriate diligence to validate certain you know, issues. Uh, are third party vendors being paid according appropriately? Uh, trusted parties or professionally accredited parties are often asked a broader question, which is you get a letter that says, you're in charge of this for the company, or, or you share responsibility for this. Do you know of anything that might arguably present an opportunity for broad liability, future scrutiny, et cetera, et cetera, in this area that you're responsible for? So the funny thing is that you're actually not affirmatively obligated as a practical matter to reply to that letter, probably, if you're outside counsel. Now, if you're internal, it gets a lot more complicated because you have to look to your policies, and I'm sure your policies say you have to be responsive to your auditors. But if you're outside counsel, you might have a little bit of room, but I would suggest that it is no longer a good best practice to completely just ignore it. At the very, very least, you have to engage in a conversation with your client, if you're outside counsel, with your client, the corporate issuer, and say, we have this letter, and here are our options for responding, um, and we're absent guidance from you, which, by the way, we may not follow your guidance because we're bound by other rules, but absence guidance from you, we're going to respond. Right? And the response doesn't have to be a whistleblow, oh, there's big problems. The response can be something like, you know, this is about as complicated of an area as you, Mr. Auditor, have ever encountered. So the answer is yes. No matter what the facts were, the answer to that broad question is yes. Come talk to me, and I'm happy to help. Right? And, and that's the appropriate response. But I know a lot of best practices in the past were kind of simply to dodge these auditor letters. And I think we should revisit that. I'm, I, it's not definitive. I wouldn't testify as an expert that it's a mistake to ignore them. But on the other hand, things have changed. And I think it's not a good idea just to ignore those letters. So what to do right now? Um, first, treat I-9 and related compliance areas as if they are a critical control function. Because they are. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a lot of times in these kinds of groups. Um, but uh, you know, take this back and show someone say, I need more than 17.4 cents per onboard for I-9s, because it's a critical control function, please. Second, uh, engage in an internal process, a la books and records, um, and policy analysis, just like you would for a books and records FCPA issue. So now there's a regular process with big companies. They say, let's go scouring the company for FCPA violations before anyone else knows so we can fix it, and we put in processes to make sure we don't have this, because process is the protective strategy for an FCPA violation, right? Violations happen. Someone's going to buy flowers for somebody somewhere. They're going to hand them to them. And especially if you're doing any business in China for FCPA, 
about half the population under our rules is counted as a government employee, right? I mean, so a state-owned enterprise, you know, way down low-level manager, government employee under FCPA. So you buy them dinner for too much, and you've got an FCPA violation potentially. But if you have process, process can save you quite a bit, maybe even help you escape it entirely. So you prevent most, you know, have some, and then process saves you. Same should be true, though it's less articulated as we know, we'll talk about it later today, same can be true in I-9 compliance. But I would suggest that the average um, issuer, the average corporation does not have a whole bunch of policy process around the I-9s, right? I, and many companies do not have, what do we do when a frontline person has missed deadlines um, more than 10 times across two months? Do we reprimand them? Do we train them? Do we do both? If you're silent on this issue, I would suggest that's an example of a failed policy, right? You need to have something that says, we do the following things, because someday there'll be a very tough conversation with somebody, and you want to be able to say, listen, companies make mistakes. We're big, sorry. But look at all this stuff we try to do correctly. And uh, in the joke of a lot of compliance, especially the stuff we talk about in corporate governance, it's not necessarily that you have to be the best, but there's kind of a herd, right? There are the predators, and there's a big group of, you know, wildebeests, and they're all running in a particular direction. You probably don't want to be way, way in the front, because you might go off the cliff, which you didn't notice, but you also don't want to be kind of lagging in the back. You want to be in the middle of the pack. So it is a little bit relative. If you can just kind of tune things up better than most, you're probably going to be okay, and they're going to pick off the, the wildebeests that are hanging out in the back first, and just don't be the wildebeest in the back. And then finally, get the attention of the CFO, the GC, and the audit chair, comp committees, and audit committees, and nomina nominating governance committees, of, of board, they care about this stuff a lot as soon as they understand it. If they don't ever really hear about it or understand it, that's when they kind of get confused. So, you know, Stanford's trying to do its best. We do some webinars, we do some stuff. We're trying to educate chairs. At this upcoming director's college, we will actually uh, have a couple of sessions that'll deal a little bit with I-9s. It's called the surprise compliance issues you don't know about, but should, you know, and I-9s are one of the topics. And uh, so it's getting out there, but if you can get these people in the organization to pay attention, that makes all the difference. I know it's e easier said than done, but um, we will be available and I'll be around to answer questions. I don't want to encroach any more in five minutes past when I should be uh, on the panel, but there's a lot of, I uh, hope, critiques and questions. I'm around all day. Uh, catch me and ask me questions or push back if you say, okay, you're just full of it. You've never set foot in the real corporate America. This doesn't work or would work. I'm interested in your feedback. So with that, I'm just going to hand it over to the next panel, and I'm actually going to just let you do all the introductions if that's okay. All right.